when I make those fires, they are real. And the one thing that's not real is that they don't film the times that the nights that I don't make fire because that's real life. On this episode of Passing Outdoors, I am going to speak to Hazen O'Dell. He is a, an adventurer, a, a survivalist, um, and he is the star of a show that's coming on in that geo soon. The show is called Primal Survivor Escape the Amazon, uh, and it sees him go through 500 miles of uh, Amazon uh, tropical rainforest in uh, Guyana. The first episode uh, he's going through a dense uh, jungle and sees the survival techniques that he uses to uh, throughout that episode. And we talk, we touch on it slightly uh, through the uh, through the interview. Again, very quick interview. Um, and there's a lot more to talk about uh, with Hazen, and uh, I look forward to to meeting him again. Hazen, hi, how are you doing? Hey, good to see you, Davey. Yeah, it's good to, good to meet you, uh, or e meet you. It would be nice if it was in in the real world, but uh, here we are on Zoom. Um, it seems to be yeah. acceptable these days. Uh, I do like to do my podcast on in real life, but I think it just hasn't, uh, obviously we couldn't work it out this time, but hopefully in the future, I'd like to sit down with you and we'll, we'll, we'll chat next time you're in the UK, possibly we could organise that, but we'll, um, well, let's, we'll... Yeah, let's get there. We can do that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the concept of my of my podcast is paths and outdoors, so it's it's moving for basically through your journey um so and and looking back at your journey at your 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 past and uh, and what you've done in the past uh i think we could probably do about two hours so i'm conscious we've only got 20 minutes so let's just concentrate on uh primal survivor um, yeah we'll put it either for sure yeah so it's a six part series going to show on wrong five part series it's going to show on uh, nat geo um yeah. and I suppose the as a as a foundation for it, you spent a lot of time in the Amazon when you were in when you were eighteen. Was that right? Well, that, uh, then ever on since. So when I was 18, 19 years old, mm-hmm. I went to I went to Ecuador for my first time. Very naively, just had my camping gear that I had from high school, which was pretty much passed down from somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And I thought I thought I was just going to go into the rainforest and see all the animals that I've always read about in books and had in my aquariums and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I wound up spending there. I thought I'd be there for a couple of weeks. I wound up being about eight months. And okay. then, uh, and then I had, I would have been kicked out of school in college if I didn't come back. So I went back and then the day school got out, uh, I was back there the next summer. And then that became about 10 years of my life. Uh, going back and forth and living half of my life in Ecuador and the rainforest. And then I think that just, well, definitely shaped me and then uh, got me onto this path of that made me the most excited about life. And that was traveling to go see animals and, and be around those people that live in those very wild places. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, as my life went, South America was always still a big part of my life, but then I started doing a lot of stuff and, Southeast Asia and the remote South Pacific and, and, um, and through all those antics, I guess there was a couple of things that I had videoed and done that and national geographic caught wind of it. And look at me now I'm doing my, my whole life's passion every day. It's so great. Well, I was, I was going to say that you found, you found your passion. That seems to be a common theme when uh, people get, uh, obviously very excited about it is, is because they are passionate about it. So you found that. I'm very lucky. I don't take it for yeah. granted. You know, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. I expect not. So on this trip, you went to Guyana uh, and you were the, your, your plan uh, was to go 500 miles across um, the tropical rainforest. Um, yeah. I think, I think probably, and I assume a lot of other viewers will, will, will something that will pop out is, the fact you were barefoot. Mm-hmm. So f- why barefoot? Well, there's there, there's definitely uh, reasons to the madness, I suppose. But, and I, I did learn a lot of these things the hard way. When I first went to Ecuador, like you're saying, when I was 19, I just brought it all the stuff that I was familiar with, what I, with what I thought I needed to be in the outdoors, you know. And uh, I got schooled pretty quickly by people who live in the outdoors, what you really need and really what you don't need. Um, 
what I learned really quickly with the stuff that I had was um, I was there during the wet season the first time. And, and when I was in Guyana, this was all during the monsoon period. So it was very much the same climate, same, same, same conditions. But um, if you have feet, if you have uh, like footwear and you're living in an environment that where there aren't sidewalks, there aren't roads, you're constantly going crossing streams, crossing rivers, going through swamps to get from point A to B because the whole that's what the terrain is. And if you're wearing shoes, your feet never dry ever in such a humid environment. And your feet can only stand being submerged in water for not very long, really. A couple after a couple of days, you start to get trench foot, you start to get, especially in the tropics, you get bacterial infections, skin funguses that make it to where literally your 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 flesh is is uh falling from the bones of your feet if you let it you know continually do that and uh if you know anybody that has horror stories about trench foot that they say that is what it starts to be like um so but then when you see the locals that are living in that environment and thriving you'll notice that they don't have shoes um firstly it comes to they don't have access to shoes so they have to act and live accordingly and uh They've spent their lives not ever having shoes. And pretty soon you start to realize they don't have skin funguses. They get scraped up and thorns and stuff. But it's not only getting your feet conditioned and toughened up, but also um, you just it's a whole new way of walking. And, and I would say it, it did take me a few years even to understand that. But once you can go without shoes, you have the upper hand on just about anybody because you don't have to fiddle with shoes. You don't have to fiddle with boots that give you blisters and then the blisters in an environment like that. Uh, you're super prone to infection, which is probably the leading cause of death in those sort of environments. So, um, yeah, your feet get scraped up and you get thorns and spines, but you're conditioned to that. And um, so that's number one reason why I do that. And uh, number two is I, I still am. We're going to the most remote places in the world with people that are living off the land. They don't have access to going to a store. They don't have that money isn't really even a part of their lives. So how are they going to get shoes? And I really, I understand that by me taking the first step in the rainforest with the things that I do, I couldn't have done it with the knowledge that I've gotten from native people that have shown me, that have taught me. And um, if I go in there with all this fancy gear and kit and all this sort of stuff, I'm immediately different than them, you know, and whether they think that uh, I'm too wimpy and puny to go out into the jungle or if I'm somehow superior to them, I don't want to ever feel like that. And so I, I kind of want to come in with sort of the similar tools and the similar uh, similar playing field. And if they already know that I've traveled a few hundred miles and through the rainforest and my feet look like they like that. I get some immediate street credit, I think, which is which is just so what I want because then I, I learn so much more. They have the confidence in telling me things so much more than if they somebody had all the tricks and doodads that makes it look like they know everything there's to know. I suppose that well the the YY people that you met who were hunting at the time, um yeah. when you were moved through, they had what looked to be like a, a like a wet what I would call a welly boot. Um, or a, a kind of rain yeah. boot. So why why is that then? I so, suppose. That, so those are like if they have wellies and stuff. Those are another big thing people don't see is like if there's a community, they all live together. They all share everything, right? And so you might have a group of people that are live off, living off the land, and there's fifty of them, and that entire group might have. Um, like three pairs of wellies in the entire community. Those are swapped around from other people. And depending on the environment, those people get to wear those shoes, but the rest of the people don't. Yeah. And so... So um, only while they're out hunting, potentially, that would be yeah, yeah, for a short period. It is very rare. And, you know, yeah. maybe it had to do a little bit with the television. They wanted to put on their, their best dress, and that's <laughs> not what they normally... But it, it, under normal yeah. circumstances, you very rarely see people that, that have. And... and um, there is also the thing, too, that's like young people have – every day is changing faster than it ever has been ever before. There's more change today than there was yesterday. 
Tomorrow is going to be the same thing. And now younger people have, have more access to getting into town. Um, they're seeing magazines where people are wearing shoes and then they start to kind of feel like, well, you know, maybe I need to wonder what people think if I don't wear shoes when I'm outside of my community. So that the, so the societies are changing really rapidly, but what I love is that, you know, if I go in there and say, yeah, that's how I was when I was a kid or that's how my grandpa used to be. And he's awesome. You know, that's, that's pretty sweet too, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, the other thing, and you mentioned it about having minimal kit and, and you did, I mean, watching the, the first episode, you were basically in cargo shorts and a, and a t-shirt and a, a, a small pack and a machete. Yeah. That's really all we saw from through the first episodes. I mean, what, what else are you carrying in that pack? What would be the other thing apart from a machete that you would take on a, on a trip like that? Uh, I, I will say, so there's, um, fortunately again, you're, you're, there's kind of a, a thing that somebody told me and it was, it was the more, you know, the less you need. Um, I understand that I am in an environment where it's, uh, 80 to 90 degrees during the middle of the day at night, it can get pretty chilly, but again, you condition yourself to the chill. You wouldn't think that 65 is that cold, 65 degrees. I don't know what that is in centigrade, but it's, you can die in those sort of temperatures if, you, if you're not keeping especially yourself if you're wet, Especially if you're yeah. in a humid, wet environment. Right. But, uh, you know, I was really reliant on – my priority always was to make a fire. Um, but in my kit, if you want to ask me specifically, um, I, if, I'll have a machete. I can do just about whatever I want as far as whittling. But I, a lot of times I like to have a little small knife to do little fine detail stuff. Um, I do carry what I love for my survival kit is I carry a pair of it's like athletic tape. I don't know what you would call it in the UK, but it's just really hard tape or yeah. when I get the real serious injuries where I need to like pull my skin together and stuff it might not be on the camera, but I do have that um, because that sort of stuff does happen and it is handy. And, and if I didn't have it, it might slow down the whole process and I got to wait, make camp for a couple of days, heal well enough, but, there's a lot of times where I'm limping all day long, but that's one thing that I, I always try to carry. Um, and yeah, just my little survival kit. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, I, if I'm able to, I'll carry fish hooks and nylon. It's always handy, but in a pinch, I do know how to get by without it too. So well, it shows, it shows in that episode that you, you could get by without it. There was a yeah. couple of uh, times when you, you fished uh, and obviously the little fish, Helped you get the big fish. Yeah, yeah. Little fish taste the same as big fish too. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. About the fishing then, um, what you got genuinely excited about the fire. Um, I I um have had some experience of, of getting fire going, but you were genuinely excited in the show. How like how um can you describe how kind of motivational that is or or kind of how it lifts your spirits when you start to get fire? Um, because when when I make those fires, they are real. And the one thing that's not real is that they don't film the times that the nights that I don't make fire <laughs> because that's real life. I mean, I'm pretty good. There are people out there, indigenous people that know how to do fires better than me. But a reality is, is when it's raining, pouring down monsoon and there's not anything, you can't make a fire and you have to live with it and understand it and suffer because of it. And, um, it may not have showed in that film, but there were a few days there where I couldn't make a fire. It was impossible. I tried. If I would have kept trying, it would have just been futile. And um, I don't, I caught that big fish, which was even a surprise to me. I was hopeful, hopefully thinking, but you never know. It's 100%. And uh, I got that big fish. And it's just like, that's a meaningful catch, but it's not something that, Again, I take for granted. It, nothing goes to waste out there. I'm there to see the animals, not to kill it. And uh, a big fish like that just means I, I have a, quite a few days off from hunting and fishing. Mm -hmm. And but it's uh, in that sort of environment. If I don't prepare it and cook it and have an ability to smoke it, it's I can only eat so much. Easy. And that that enabled me to I can feed off that fish for over a week. And that's why I was a light elated in so many ways. Not. Yeah. That being said, too, 
I can stay warm and I can just dry myself. Every, every night I try to dry off my feet. It's like feet maintenance. Again, things that I've learned from indigenous people. So yeah, yeah my genuine, uh, my genuine happiness about that was purely genuine. Yeah. Well, Hazen, it's been uh, it's been great to to speak to you. Um, I, I literally I could probably speak to you for another hour and a half. So uh, I would like to catch up with you at another time. Uh, but um, I'll be looking forward to watching the rest of the uh, Primal Survivor, and uh, I hope you uh, have a great time in the UK. Thank you very much. Yeah, do your sleuthing, and we'll stay in contact, please. Okay, as you saw there, um, it was quite rushed. We did have a, a short period of time to talk, but um, I really look forward to hearing more about uh, about his travels through uh, all sorts of different environments, but obviously definitely the uh, sort of Amazon rainforest type environments, jungle environments. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Um, remember, like, subscribe. Watch the Primal Survivor show on Nat Geo. It's coming out on the 14th of April. Um, I know I'll be watching the other episodes because I did actually enjoy it. It was really good. So um, let us know what you think and let me know what you think of Primal Survivor. Catch you again soon. Mm-hmm.